Um, um, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, and thank you all so much for being here bright and early. Um, uh, and welcome to today's panel, um, the first panel of today, which is the paradox of setting global norms and the selective application of R2P as part of the 37th annual Norris and Marjorie Bendiston Epic International Symposium on Problems Without Passports. My name is Ellie Murphy, and I'm from Bedford Hills, New York. I'm currently a senior studying international relations and sociology. Today, we hope to explore the pressing issue of international intervention and the application of responsibility to protect. To tackle transnational problems without passports that extend state borders, international and global co collaboration is imperative. Facilitating this collaboration among countries necessitates the setting of global norms or of shared expectations and standards of appropriate behavior by states and intergovernmental organizations. Unsurprisingly, setting a global norm is an incredible undertaking. It requires extended amounts of time and agreement among member states, which often have opposing opinions. Responsibility to protect a global political commitment established by the United Nations in 2005 seeks to prevent mass atrocity crimes, such as genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. This demonstrates the difficulty in establishing a global norm. This global policy emerged in response to the lack of effective action to stop or prevent the mass atrocities in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. R2P establishes that every state is responsible for protecting its populations from mass atrocity crimes, including genocide and war crimes, and the international community has the responsibility to aid states in meeting this commitment. If a state fails to uphold the agreement, R2P states that the international community must respond in accordance with the UN Charter. In the most extreme cases, this can include international intervention. Ultimately, the goal of this agreement is to prevent future genocides and mass atrocities. However, while revered among certain international policymakers, many aspects of R2P have been controversial. Specifically, who is held accountable and who is not? when it is implemented, and most notably in times when it has not been. For example, many cite the lack of implementation of R2P in response to the now acknowledged genocide of the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. The same controversy with the application of R2P is relevant when discussing the ongoing cultural genocide of the Uyghur Muslims in China. More recently, the lack of implementing R2P after Russia's invasion of Ukraine has also sparked significant criticism. These examples demonstrate that R2P is arguably flawed in terms of its implementation. Given all this, we are left with one central question. Can R2P be considered a global or universal norm when it might only be applied to weaker states or states without superpower backing? The panel today will address this question along with a wider analysis of the role of international intervention. And I would like to thank all of the panelists for being here today. Um, but before I introduce them, I would like to explain how this panel will run. Each panelist will first give an, a, a, an introduction or presentation of around five to seven minutes, essentially an oral op-ed. We have this time constraint to ensure we have enough time for the next segments of the panel, which are a discussion among the panelists and a question and answer session with the audience. The panelists' full bios are in the program, but I wanted to provide a brief background information about them here. And with that, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, which is Dr. Noel Crossley. Dr. Crossley is a lecturer in international organizations and international security in the Department of Political Science at University College London. Dr. Crossley's interests include the responsibility to protect human security, peacekeeping and humanitarianism. Much of her work involves the issue of consistency in global norm setting and humanitarian intervention. 
She is the author of Evaluating the Responsibility to Protect um, Mass Atrocity Prevention as a Consolidating Norm in International Society. And her newest book has just appeared, which is entitled um, Understanding Humanitarian Protection. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Crossley, and you're welcome to give your opening remarks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, um, I was tasked uh, with the role of briefly um, defining uh, the concept of norm and how we might measure norm consolidation. So um, what I have prepared for you is a very brief PowerPoint presentation, which I hope uh, will shed a bit more light on the meaning of norm. I think what we need um, to realize is that there are different ways in which the term norm is being used. And that sometimes leads to confusion, particularly when we think about is R2P a norm? Um, how consolidated is it as a norm of international society? So I think it makes sense to step back and think about how do we define the meaning of a norm in the first place. So if we think about it in terms of a norm of social practice, which is different to the meaning of um, the responsibility to protect or any other norm as a norm in international law, which we'll talk about a little uh, later on. So if we think about it as a norm of social practice, then um, I think what we are referring to is as you can see here, uh, to be on the slide, harmony of conduct or practice with past performance or stated aims. Another um, dimension of consistency, so if we think about it in terms of selective application of a norm or the responsibility to protect norm, if indeed uh, we conclude that it is a norm, is um, the extent to which there is agreement or harmony of parts or features of this norm um, to one another or a whole. So how consistent is the responsibility to protect as a norm in terms of its um, individual components, the principles that make up uh, the norm? And how consistent is it with regard to the way in which it fits in to the normative structure of international society. So I think these are two separate dimensions that it is worth thinking about um, individually. Okay, so let's start with the second one. Harmony of conduct or practice with past performance or stated aims. So that is something, a standard against which we can measure the responsibility to protect. Do states routinely respond to grave violations of human rights? And if so, how do they respond? Do we observe that there is consistency of practice uh, with regard to international responses? Okay, so uh, for those of you familiar with statistics, this is a normal distribution. And um, so if we think about a norm in theoretical terms, um, from a sociological perspective, we would understand a norm to be a routine, a regular, a habitual type of behavior and social practice. So look around in the room today, um, most or almost all of you are wearing a face mask, okay? It is an appropriate thing to do in this context, um, given um, that this is uh, uh, the middle of or the end of a pandemic, okay? So, so you think it is appropriate um, to be wearing a face mask, hence you wear a face mask. So I think um, wearing a face mask would probably be um, somewhere in the middle of this normal distribution. But that is not to say that if um, on occasion some individuals do not wear a face mask, that there is not a strong norm of wearing a face mask in public space, face, spaces currently. So, so this is one way that we can think about um, a norm. Okay, so if we bear that in mind, where do we stand? Right, so before we come to R2P as a norm, I think there are different types of norms. So some norms are adhered to um, very frequently. So the shape of the curve um, is, is narrower. 
whereas other norms, there's greater deviation in terms of the range of practice that we observe. Okay, so where are we in terms of the responsibility to protect as a norm? So I think one way of thinking about this would be that is there, if there is a robust and consistent response to grave violations of human rights and mass atrocities, then we can see, then we can observe that there is a norm of social practice. And this is quite independent of what we observe uh, in international law. Um, and it is independent of what we think is the right thing to do in terms of ethics. So I think the key thing to bear in mind with norms in general is that they are um, they are value neutral. It is observing practice. So if we got to a point where, as a matter of routine, we responded internationally when we observed these grave violations of human rights, uh, then I think we can begin uh, to see the consolidation of R2P as a norm of international practice. Okay, um, moving to uh, the first part of the de definition, agreement or harmony of parts or features to one another or a whole in terms of the consistency of R2P uh, as a norm. And, and we'll talk much more uh, about this dimension uh, later on uh, throughout the course of the panel. So as you can see, there are um, many different things that might qualify as norms or habitual behavior in international practice. And so where does R2P fit in here? And where does it fit in the hierarchy of norms? So if we have the norm of wearing a face mask, um, in what conditions is it appropriate to be wearing a face mask? That's one dimension of it, but what do we also observe actually happens in practice? So in what circumstances do individuals remove uh, their face mask? And, and in that sense, I think um, there is much more work to be done in terms of R2P as a norm, in terms of figuring out um, which other norms are there and which norm takes precedence in which circumstances. And that's the end of my video. So much, Dr. Cosley, for your insights. Um, I'll now introduce our second panelist, Dr. Karen Smith. Um, Dr. Karen Smith served as special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on the responsibility to protect from January 9, oh, 2019 to July 2021. She teaches international relations at the His Institute for History at Leiden University in the Netherlands and is an honorary research associate at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, where she was based. Dr. Smith's research focuses on non-Western contributions to international relations, as well as on the changing global order. Recent publications include a co-edited book, International Relations from the Global South, and a co-edited special issue, Challenging the Single Origin Story of IR in Review of International Studies. Um, Dr. Smith, Smith, you are welcome to give your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Ellie. And I also just want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. I've been here for the last few days and it's been absolutely um, fantastic to listen to all of the presentations, but also to interact with some of the students. I've already learned a lot. So I just want to really thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, and I'm also very happy that we're talking about the responsibility to protect, um, because as you know, it's a uh, it's perhaps a, a topic that is not always addressed, uh, especially not in undergraduate courses. So I'm uh, I'm very happy, and I think that might have something to do with uh, with your uh, professor Williams sitting at the back there. That he may have something to do with uh, the focus on RTP. So so very very glad uh, to hear that. I just wanted to say that. Um, even though I am an IR scholar and an academic, uh, I don't look at R2P from an academic perspective. So my uh, my input is going to be completely from the practical uh, experience that I've had serving as special advisor and the you know the interactions I've had with member states, etc. Um, and so I perhaps start by saying that um, you know I'm, I'm I learn a lot by listening to people like uh, Noel as well because that's you know. In terms of norms, I think it's very important for us to unpack what it means when we talk about R2P, whether it is an international norm or not. 
Um, but I also think that sometimes academic discussions about norms and about RTP can become quite theoretical and abstract. So I wanted to just quickly just come back to remind ourselves what it is that we're talking about. What is, what is R2P? What is the responsibility to protect? It's essentially about preventing the gravest human rights violations, the killing of people based not on what they did, but who they are. Um, and I think it's also important to, uh, for us when we think about it as a norm to think about what actually happened uh, in 2005 when unanimously the member states of the UN adopted this principle, right? And at the UN, we refer to it as a principle, not a norm. And that's a you know debate that we can get into. Um, but what happened when they actually adopted this norm? It was, a, it was a major shift in terms of thinking about sovereignty, sovereignty as perhaps being you know, the foundational norm on which the international system is based. And so this rethinking of sovereignty as not a right, so not just a right of states, right, a right of governments, but actually a responsibility. So a responsibility that governments have towards their own people, but not just towards their own people, also towards people in other states, right? That That is a major shift in terms of international relations. And that's something that I think we should not lose sight of. Um, I also want to say that, of course, despite the existence of R2P, whether or not we consider it to be a norm, and the promises of never again, we know that mass atrocities continue to happen as we speak in different parts of the world. And so it's clear that as an international community, as UN member states, but also as individuals, we have failed to fulfill the promise made in 2005 to protect populations from atrocity crimes. Now, I also want to say here that my argument is that this is not a failure of the principle or the norm. It's a failure of its implementation. Um, and this is partly due to the problem of selective application, which is part of what we will be talking about today. Now, this is not to say that there have not been positive developments with regards to both the conceptual and the operational evolution of the principle. Um, at the practical level, there are a number of success stories of where action has prevented the occurrence of the most horrific crimes, and maybe we can get into some of these in the discussion. Um, also, if we look at what's been happening institutionally, both within the United Nations in terms of continued support for the principle, something uh, which I can elaborate on perhaps later in, in, uh, in the questions uh, se uh, section of this panel as well. Um, we've also seen institutional developments at the national level with uh, many, many governments appointing what are called RTP focal points. So these are senior officials in governments that have the responsibility to look at how the rest of government actually thinks about atrocity prevention uh, in all of the work that they do. But I think we also need to make a distinction between the prevention side of R2P, which has received a lot of attention, and there's been quite a lot of progress made in that regard. Um, so some of the success stories that I refer to are also successes of prevention, whereas we've not seen so much success in terms of the reactive side of R2P, right? The response side. And so I think the simple fact is that we've not done enough. Um, we've not done enough for the Rohingya people who um, Ellie has already mentioned, who dare not go home for fear of being slaughtered. We've not done enough for the women of South Sudan, whose daily lives are plagued with memories and fears of sexual violence. We've not done enough for the children of Syria, who know no life other than that of death and fear. And I also think um, it's important for our discussion to note that while there has been this emphasis, particularly in the UN, on emphasizing the prevention side of RTP, and that has to do as well with which parts of RTP are regarded as controversial by states, and that we can get into that as well. Um, this kind of false perception that RTP is primarily about military intervention remains pervasive. Um, and part of that then also is that because of that, it remains a matter for the UN Security Council. Um, and I think this neglects uh, this, this neglects the reality that what we have witnessed in recent years is really not over eagerness um, for military intervention in states to prevent the commission of atrocity crimes, but rather great reluctance of states to take any action, even in the face of grave crimes being committed. And so here I want to just um, remind us, and, and Elias also referred to this in her introduction, that action 
can take many forms, including all of the peaceful instruments available under the UN Charter, things like mediation, fact-finding missions, uh, peacekeeping as well, sanctions in terms of economic uh, mechanisms, and of course, military action in line, as Elias pointed out, with the UN Charter is the very, very last resort. And of course, they can only be authorized by UN Security Council resolution, not by an individual state. And this is, of course, one of the things that sets R2P apart from humanitarian intervention. So we have to make that distinction as well. But I want to end on this note that we also need to think about R2P and we think about all the norms associated with R2P, not just as a peace and security issue, but as a human rights issue. Um, because by their very nature, atrocity crimes constitute the most serious human rights violations. And we also know that human rights violations are the precursors to the commission of atrocity crimes. Um, and so I think we should think about this when we think about selective applicability as well, which is something which we'll talk about too. Um, and then just finally, I also want you to think about uh, when you're thinking perhaps about questions that you can ask us later about some of the issues that have been touched on in some of the panels over the last few days that I think link very well to some of the things that we'll be talking about today. So uh, the first panel, the first evening was about, uh, you know, social media and how hate speech and incitement to violence can be spread through social media. And I think that's such an important thing to talk about in this uh, case as well. Um, yesterday, we spoke about climate refugees, right? So of course, there's a big question about um, does climate change constitute a, uh, a, a mass atrocity threat, right? Uh, and in what sense do we talk about it as a, as a threat multiplier or should climate change be included in the kind of mandate of RTP? So these are questions that we can talk about and also just refugees. There will be a panel later today on, on uh, refugees and migration as well. Where does that fit into our thinking about RTP? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for your remarks. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our third and final panelist today, um, Kieran Gore. Kieran Gore is the counsel in law, the law offices of Charles H. Camp, PC, working on all facets of international dispute resolution. Over the past 10 years, Ms. Gore has developed expertise in public and private international law, foreign investment strategies, and international dispute resolution. She is the co-author of the article, Nation States Must Comply with Their Responsibility to Protect Ukraine Against the Russian Federation's Ongoing War Crimes in the March 20, uh, 2022 edition of the World Financial Review, copies of which have been provided by the publication for members of our audience. Ms. Gore, you are welcome to give your opening remarks. Thank you, Ellie, and thank you to my co-panelists. I've been here for the past three days and have learned so much from not only all the panelists, but also from each of you students, because I am not an international relations person. I've never studied international relations or international affairs or international policy. I'm squarely a lawyer. Um, and I look at international disputes and I write and research and study um, public international law. So when you take that perspective that I bring to the table, I look at this very differently than many of you might and many of my pa fellow panelists do. Usually when I see a challenge, and to be clear, I'm usually wearing litigator hats, uh, litigator glasses. So I'm usually looking for a problem and how to prosecute and, and find a breach and resolve that problem. And I'm usually looking for obligations and breaches. And so I use the word obligations rather than responsibilities. Um, and, and breaches means when you don't meet your obligations. Uh, those obligations will usually require remedies or redress of some kind, and the law requires that. So as a public international lawyer, my inquiry is more about balancing those concepts with the concepts of sovereignty. So it's not that different from what Karen does in her work. Um, and sovereignty is a really strange concept. It means that a particular actor, a state actor, is enjoying a privileged position that's so inviolable that states are considered accepted from the law and then cannot be prosecuted for their actions in national courts unless there are certain exceptions available. So I draw upon those ideas and then probably the same systems and structures that many international relation folks look at. So we already have in place United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the network of conventions and treaties that states have voluntarily signed onto. That's our system that we have. 
Um, I can't comment on whether they work or whether they're broken or whether they're ill-founded. Actually, I think my fellow co-panelists and each of you are probably better placed to critique those systems. But what I do is I take those systems as a given and I try to make them work and I try to find legal obligations within them. So when I take this approach, I'm usually looking at things as a transnationalist. And some of you may have encountered transnational theory in your classes and in your work. If you're interested in learning more about it from a legal perspective, I would commend you to the work of Professor Harold Coe of Yale Law School. He's also the former US legal advisor and currently co-counsel to Ukraine at the ICJ proceedings. So transnationalists approach international relations and international law with respect for the structures that we have. So that's the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, trades, uh, tra treaties, conventions, what have you, all those systems that exist following the post-World War II era, including the International Court of Justice. Unilateralists, on the other hand, are exemplified by acts of coercion and go it alone tactics. So if we want a really great example of that in recent history, we can look to the perspectives of President Donald Trump and his America first ideology. So it was very much we're in it for America first and it's not about the rest of the world as much as it is about prioritizing our own goals. So if we turn back to wearing all these um, ideas and lenses with us to R2P, that's where the structure comes into play. R2P isn't delineated in any treaty or convention, but many scholars, nations, and the United Nations itself recognize it as an international norm, and thus part of, I would argue, customary international law, which might be a controversial proposition. Once a principle is accepted as a principle of customary international law, it becomes binding upon all states, regardless of whether it's codified as such, and importantly, regardless of whether the state consents. This is inherent to the transnationalist view, which values cooperation over unilateral tactics and coercion and sheer force. So if we accept R2P as an international norm, which it likely is, and Noelle can tell us more about whether she agrees with that view, um, we can also accept that it's been recognized and although it's been selectively applied to date, we have a large track record of its the norm turning into an increasingly growing movement. It's been invoked by the UN Security Council at least 80 times. It's been invoked in Human Rights Council resolutions at least 50 times. And it's been invoked in General Assembly resolutions at least 13 times. So I would posit that it's binding upon all states. R2P can also be seen in the Fourth Geneva Convention for the Protection of Civilian Persons in Times of War, and specifically that convention provides that civilians are to be protected from murder, torture, or brutality. So in 2000, when the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty convened in Canada, it articulated a global responsibility to protect, react to, and rebuild following human rights, rights crises. In 2009, the UN Secretary General released a report on the responsibility to protect and has done so every year, demonstrating the gradual acceptance of the principle. Additionally, supporters of the responsibility to protect principle rely upon the belief that the underlying principles and goals of the UN Charter can only be realized when its text is read in the context of changing geopolitical and economic realities. So although Article 2.4 of the UN Charter does not include an exception for unilateral intervention involving the use of force based on humanitarian interests, it's understood that the Charter aims to promote peace and respect for human rights. Thus, I would argue that customary international law must evolve where a normative change has taken place and international law recognizes the responsibility to protect and the legitimacy of unilateral force only in limited circumstances. The UN Charter also provides that all member states shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such manner that the international peace and security and justice are not endangered and that all members shall refrain from in their international relations from the threat or use of force against territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purpose of the United Nations. So in sum, the UN Charter reflects the worldview, the transnationalist worldview that we collectively adopt, adopted as states following World War II, that Unilateral tactics, coercion, sheer force would no longer be tolerated to compel individuals or other states to it personal ambitions or desires. So this is where 
I would bring in the idea of breach. The relevance of these principles to today's world cannot be underscored. We're going to turn the rest of this panel to whether selective application can change these norms or whether it impacts whether these norms are actually legally binding as customary international law. I won't spend too much time on that because I think even in the question and answer section that we have with the audience, we'll focus on that as well. But I'd like to stop there for the time being. Thank you so much for your remarks, Ms. Gore. Um, we'll now move on to the moderated section of our panel. Um, and all of these questions are open to all of the panelists. And I'd like to start us off by asking a question that you've all touched upon in your opening remarks, but it really gets to the crux of what this panel aims to address. And that is, do you consider R2P to be an international norm? And Dr. Crossley, if you'd like to start us off. Yeah, so I, um, I already outlined um, the way in which I think we can, the ways in which I think we can define norm and then begin to think about how we could measure normative consolidation. Um, so there is already a bit of empirical work uh, on that, uh, much of it qualitative, but there is also an emerging uh, literature, a paper that I'm currently working on, uh, exploring whether we can actually measure the, uh, quantitatively the extent to which protection norms are gaining traction. So this, I think, is work in progress, but, um, but we're making progress. Um, but I think, um, so based on, on, on my previous research, I think the way in which I would answer this is that, first of all, we need to distinguish um, the legal dimension, um, the extent to which it is um, being incorporated or, or in which uh, existing law, I should say, is being reinterpreted um, to make space uh, for this emerging norm. This is one dimension. And the other dimension is uh, whether international practice is changing. Um, and uh, I, I think we, we tend to be quite pessimistic. We, we tend to say, well, there is still selectivity and not enough is being done. And, and we uh, tend to overlook the progress that we've already made. And I think that progress is actually uh, quite substantial and, and quite significant. We now have um, many more international institutions that are either exclusively working on uh, protection, international protection, uh, and many more organizations and institutions, state as well as non-state and civil society that are working uh, on uh, matters related to uh, the responsibility to protect. So I think uh, both at the institutional level as well as in terms of international civil society, um, things have really changed. There is now a much greater awareness is, um, is never really the case anymore. Um, that protection crises aren't uh, at the very least being um, discussed uh, and uh, international actors attempting to think about how best to respond to these crises, even if they are difficult uh, and will remain uh, difficult to address. Thank you. Would any other panelists like to contribute? Let me approach the same idea in a different way than Noel. Um, let's look at whether R2P is actually um, a matter of customary international law. Customary international law is an aspect of international law that involves pr principles of custom. So that shouldn't be surprising, but what does that really mean? It's general principles of international law, treaties. Custom is what the International Court of Justice and the United Nations and many member states among them consider to be primary sources of international law. So how does something become a custom of international law or a piece of customary international law? It's the fact that it's general, general practice that makes it accepted as law. So through repeated invocation, recognition, practice, it becomes a topic that is part of customary international law. And then once it is embodied as part of inter customary international law, it becomes binding upon states. So that's where that idea of breach that I described earlier comes in. That if you do not, if it is truly part of customary international law, because it is part of our international norms, then it also can be breached by, by states parties. This is a challenge for R2P, and in particular, one that I think Karen and Noel have studied more closely, because it must be repeatedly invoked. There can be selective application, and whether that is appropriate, given all the struggles and conflicts taking place around the world quietly or loudly, there are very many of them at the moment. Some of them are louder than others. But the fact that they must be invoked and mentioned 
does not change because responsibility to protect in order to become a part of customary international law, it must be invoked. It should be regarded. It should be acted upon. But even if it's not acted upon, it's only selectively imply, uh, applied, doesn't change that needs to be invoked because that's what gives it the status as customary international law. It's also worth noting that the idea of customary international law rebalances public international law. There's long been ideas that states must consent to law, that they must enter treaties, they must enter conventions, and by doing so, that's how something is binding upon states parties. Customary international law pushes back against that concept and says that if something is so widely accepted, for example, as Noel described, wearing a, a mask in public settings where the building rules tell you you must and we're in the middle, midst of a public health crisis is so widely accepted that failing to do so can put you in breach of the obligation. And that's precisely the idea that is required here. We need to build public consensus, invoke it, refer to it, refer to um, responsibly to protect, and failure to even mention it creates the risk that R2P is not part of customary international law. So whether it's a norm, perhaps if we can establish that it is, it's repeated invocation and, and consistent application becomes critical because that's whether there are legal obligations to act or not. Um, this obviously pushes back up against the idea of sovereignty in some really interesting ways. Um, but given our transnationalist view that I would adopt and that I would advocate in favor of, it becomes incredibly important. Thank you both for your insights. Um, I'd like to get at this question of norm further um, because in our previous panel, um, global racism, past, present, and future, we were able to discuss how much of IR theory is rooted in Eurocentric theories of international relations. So when considering this, I'm curious how you see how this applies to the responsibility to protect. And do you see that this is a global policy based on the Western conception of human and political rights? And Dr. Smith, if you'd like to comment on that. Thank you very much. I also just wanted to briefly mention with regards to the previous question, I'm, I'm not a legal scholar, so I can't comment on whether RTP is a legal norm, but I would certainly um, like to believe that it's a political norm, right? I don't think that there's a question anymore about the responsibility of both individual states to protect their own populations, but also the responsibility of the international community to protect populations. So in that sense, I think, and I would even go as far as to say it's no longer an emerging norm, it's an established norm. That is no longer questioned at the UN or, or elsewhere. And I think it also, we can see that in the sense that it informs discussions in, for example, the Security Council around peacekeeping operations, uh, we now see that protection of civilian mandates, even though uh, protection of civilians is a slightly different norm from RTP, I think it's part of that broader normative framework, um, you know, that, that that's become kind of almost, uh, you know, every day, right? We, we are hardly seeing new peacekeeping operations that don't have a piece uh, of protect, uh, protection of civilians mandate. So I think in that sense, we can really see say that this is a this is a political norm that that now has been established, right? Um, whether it's still contested in terms of its application is a different is a different question. Um, but I also like the the I think it's a it was a title that I read recently by a, an author who said what doesn't kill a norm makes it stronger, right? So I think that's that's also the other side of it. Sometimes contestation is not a bad thing. Um, I think this is a really important question that you asked because. There are many, many misconceptions and misunderstandings about what R2P is. And one of the big ones is, and this is something that I came up against a lot at the UN, is that it's a Western norm, right? So this is something that emerged from the West. It's based in kind of Western understandings of human rights and responsibilities, and, and therefore it doesn't apply to the rest of the world. Um, now, as somebody from South Africa, I take that I take offense at that, right? Because I think it really neglects the multiple origins of this norm, um, and it really uh, neglects the contributions that have been made by individuals, but also states in the global south, both uh, with regards to the conceptual and the operational development of the principle. Um, as I said earlier, you know, RTP needs to be distinguished from pre-2005 forms of humanitarian intervention for various reasons. But I think one of the one of the negative effects of that has been 
that we've separated R2P from its historical precedents. And I think sometimes it's important for us to kind of look back into history um, because what that has done is that it's limited the conversation to mostly Western action and inaction. Um, and it has framed ideas or concerns around intervention on the basis of humanitarian concerns as a Western idea. Now, while this certainly serves the political agenda of some states, on both sides of the debate. As I've said, it, it really silences the valuable contribu contribution of uh, the Global South in terms of atrocity prevention and response, both in terms of ideas and practice. And I think it also overlooks the fact that what today we think of as the responsibility to protect is founded on centuries of thinking and practice from around the world about the responsibility of political leaders to their people, um, as well as a very long history in different parts of the world of interventions on the basis of what today we would call humanitarian factors. And here I just give you some examples. Uh, India's intervention in East Pakistan in 1971, Vietnam's intervention in Cambodia in 1978, which by the way uh, was of course condemned by the West for biological reasons, right? Tanzania's intervention in Uganda uh, in the same year, in 1978, in response to uh, the terror of Idi Amin. Um, and of course, there are more recent examples as well. So the point I'm trying to make is that R2P builds on existing ideas and practice, not just from the West, right? The idea that you should not, it's not okay to kill somebody because of their identity, that is not a Western idea, right? That is a human idea. Uh, that is a global idea. And so I also wanted to point out very specifically that um, R2P, very specifically, if we're now just looking at the responsibility to protect, also very much drew on existing ideas emanating from Africa in particular. And these include, um, some of you might be familiar with the, the work of uh, Sudanese diplomat and scholar and later special advisor on the prevention of uh, genocide, Francis Deng. Uh, his work on sovereignty as responsibility, which was really more about interning these internally displaced people, but that idea really informed the idea of R2P. Um, and also, uh, there was a shift in the organization of African Union, uh, later, African Union, later to become the African Union, uh, from this idea of non-intervention, right, which is, was a kind of founding principle of the, of the OAU, to one of non-indifference, um, and that was, of course, also reflected in the founding charter of the African Union in Art Article 4H, which essentially is RTP language, right, before it was even adopted uh, in the General Assembly of, of the UN. So I think these, this, these are important things to remember. Um, and I also just wanted to emphasize, so uh, there was mention made of the role of Canada in setting up this commission, right, in 2001 that came up with the uh, the report that that framed this term RTP. Um, but of course, even though it was funded by the Canadians, it was uh, the, the, the commissioners came from different parts of the world. And one of the commission, commissioners happens to be the current president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa. Um, and so they, they really kind of drew ideas from around the world. They consulted different researchers, civil society from around the world. So again, even that was not a Western process. Um, and I'll come back later to, because I know there's some Brazilians in the room, uh, in terms of conceptual development, the, the Brazilian innovation of responsibility while protecting, which was a response to what happened in Libya in 2011, I think is, is, was a major innovation. And that is a discussion which I really think needs to be revitalized. But thanks very much, Ellie. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the panelists on this question? Um, in that case, then I'll move on to our next question. And we've discussed how um, R2P has become more widely accepted among the international community. But I'd like to ask if you consider um, R2P to be controversial today. And Dr. Crossley, if you'd like to start us off. Yeah, OK. Um, I uh, actually published an article about um, precisely this question um, a couple of years ago, um, entitled, Is R2P Still Controversial? Um, and so I, I think, um, first and foremost, we need, we need to distinguish um, the different dimensions of the responsibility to protect. So I think um, intervention as a part of the responsibility to protect 
is still controversial, um, military intervention, and it will remain uh, controversial because it is it is uh, a very sensitive uh, question. So, uh, but I think many other aspects of the responsibility to protect are are much less controversial, um, and I think. Um, for that reason, because of the shift in the conceptualization of protection responsibility, I think for that reason, it is less controversial than it has been in the past, which is not to say that there is not still um, critique out there, that some uh, actors, and it, 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 we need to think about you know, who is critical of the concept and why. And this is about questions of agency, um, who is doing the protecting? Who are the protectees? Um, how much uh, say do protectees have um, in uh, the way in which intervention is conducted? Um, the role of regional organizations, are regional actors involved um, in uh, um, civilian protection? Um, so, so these, I think, are valid questions. And I, I think policymakers and practitioners shouldn't shy away uh, from these questions, but engage uh, with this um, critique. I, th I think that is really, really important. Um, so I think, yes, I think some elements of uh, the principle um, continue to be controversial, but other aspects of the principle are much less controversial. If you think about mediation, for example, um, that is very uncontroversial. It's a practice that we have known for decades. Uh, for centuries, um, and, and and I think the idea that there should be a, a, a coordinated response, and the idea that perhaps it's good a good idea to have mediation facilities um, uh, uh, institutionalized within international and regional organizations. I don't think there's anything particularly controversial about that. So so these uh, ideas I think are beginning um, to gain traction. Um, as are the ideas around international sanctions. Um, these can be very clever tools if they are used wisely. Economic statecraft can be an incredibly powerful tool, as we are seeing um, in the current context. Um, and um, they may also be, um, we, we may need to think very carefully about how they are used. So they need, need to be uh, smart, uh, so they need to target the right um, individuals, but they are nevertheless a very powerful tool. And I think towards the end of the spectrum of coercive activities that are perhaps less controversial uh, than military intervention. If I could draw upon Noelle's comments from a legal perspective, there's certainly a difference between whether political norms and societal norms therefore equate to legal norms and therefore equate to customary international law. So I think that's a controversy that we won't see passing us anytime soon. That said, um, ass assuming that we, we remain within that rubric, what kind of legal obligations we have is, is really a critical question. And I think Noelle engaged some really interesting features of that. It, it's without a doubt, many conflicts are violent or otherwise harmful to the general public before there's an opportunity for mediation, settlement discussions, um, treaty, peace treaties, peace negotiations, et cetera. So what's also controversial is what that intervention needs to look like. It doesn't have to be, if things have escalated into mass atrocities and other harms, the intervention need not be military intervention or military intervention need not be the only approach. And we have plenty of examples. And I think Karen can well point us to examples um, throughout history of, of what that can look like. I might just add one further dimension to it, which is peace talks, mediations, et cetera, need not be bilateral experiences. Um, for example, the Indus Waters Treaty, which settled a very long running water dispute between Pakistan and India was brokered through the World Bank. And the World Bank's role in doing so was so instrumental that it led to the idea of forming ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement and Investment Disputes. Um, ICSID is where a lot of international political 
economic disputes are resolved and, and investment treaties and, and other kinds of um, multilateral agreements and trade agreements will refer their disputes to ICSID as an institution to settle their disputes through private international arbitration. So that's an example. It's not one that goes to mass atrocities and, and, and presenting those solutions, but it's an example of an institution that we've been able to build, which, which primarily comes out of the idea of, well, what is that responsibility and obligation to intervene? And, and how do we manifest that? It doesn't need to be military intervention. It could be other kinds of intervention. So I think the controversy is less so that we must do something, but but what do you do? And, and what obligations does it create upon various actors, whether they're states or international institutions? Thanks, Ellie. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I just want to I just want to add three quick points. So just I thought it was really important that Noel said that it really depends. The question about you know whether RGP is seen as controversial, particularly intervention, is you know has to do with the actors. So who is doing the intervening or the protecting, and who needs to be protected? And so I just really want to emphasize again that the legitimacy of any kind of RGP action really has to be seen in a historical context. Right? We have to take into account. The, the legacy, the historical legacy of colonialism, of foreign intervention by Western powers in many parts of the world, because this is obviously going to have very important perception, uh, implications for perceptions of legitimacy. And this is why, again, uh, Noel also briefly referred to the role of regional organizations, which hopefully we can come back to. And I know there's that's an interest of some people in the audience here, not looking at anyone in, in particular. Um, but so regional organizations, I think, you know, in some cases, not in all cases, have that legitimacy that perhaps the UN or uh, you know Western powers don't have. The second thing I want to say is that. The, Again, you know, this is something that I often heard from outside of the UN when I was inside the UN, that there was this perception that there's a lot of resistance to RTP in the UN. There isn't, right? There are a few very loud voices in the UN, and these happen to be states like Cuba, Syria, Iran, Venezuela, Myanmar. Now, you know, uh, what do they have in common, right? So is this a group that you want to associate yourself with? Not really, right? So we see a trend here. Who are the states that are very vocal in opposing R2P? These are the states that are, you know, essentially committing atrocities against their own people. So it's very obvious why they are opposing R2P. Um, so I think I want to make that point clear. And in terms of the overall acceptance of the principle, right? If you look at voting, last year we had the the, the second only general resolution on RTP passed in the UN since, so that was the first one after 2009, passed last year with a uh, affirmative vote of 115, number of uh, abstentions, but that, that's a strong support of R2P. So, in, 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 and I'm not gonna go into the details of what that resolution said, but that gives us a general indication that there's not as much controversy as sometimes academics would like us to believe, right? So. There. Thank you for your comments. Um, for the sake of time, so we have enough time for the question and answer section, um, I think we only have time for one more question. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask if the issue with R2P is as a policy, or is it with the current structure of the United Nations and specifically the Security Council? Um, what And given this, what can and should be done to mitigate the inconsistency of the implementation of R2P? And Dr. Smith, if you'd like to start us off. Sorry, I'm talking a lot, <laughs> um, but I feel very passionate about this. So um, I would start by saying that we cannot get around the question of political will, right? So I think the main problem is one of political will. Um, and I started off in my introductory remarks saying that there's not a lot of appetite for any kind of intervention, particularly not military, to save lives, right? That is just not, that's not the kind of era that we're in. And so things change, you know, times have changed. I don't know what we call the era that we're in at the moment. I think it's something like the post, post 9-11 order. Um, and I mean, just with the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan last year, I think that really kind of nailed the end of that era, right? So we are in this era where, partly due to the dynamics in the Security Council, the space, but also the appetite for the use of force to respond to atrocities has seriously declined. Um, so that is something that we need to take into account. The Security Council, I'm just going to say it here. I think the Security Council is an unrepresentative, illegitimate body, right? <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, do with that what you wish, but so that, that is a big problem. Okay. So, um, that, that is a problem and that constrains the way that we think can think about alternatives to, uh, you know, the use of force, for example, even though I think we should be looking towards regional organizations. Um, but in light of this serious failing, we, you know, states have to explore alternative mechanisms for preventing and responding to atrocity crimes. We cannot leave it up to 15 and in reality, five states, right? Because that is what is happening right now. We're sitting back and saying the Security Council is deadlocked. Oh, too bad, right? Not quite, because we know that there are other things happening with regards to Ukraine, for example. Um, but in terms of what can be done, so I want to start with the Security Council, even though you, you know my views on it. Um, I think there are things that can try to address the problem of uh, inconsistency and in selective application. So there's the French Mexican initiative, which some of you might be aware of. Um, there's also a related code of conduct under the ACT group. But essentially what this is about, it's a move to say um, that permanent members of the Security Council do not use their veto in situations of atrocity crimes, right? So that they voluntarily give up their right to the veto. And there are now more than 120 states who support this proposal. Um, unfortunately, only two of the P5, the UK and France, right? So that is a problem in itself. But that's building some pressure to say, we find it unacceptable that you know five states can hold the world capture when it comes to such a serious issue as atrocity crimes. Um, I want to just briefly mention the uh, responsibility while protecting. So this is something which came out of uh, you know what happened in Libya, which we can talk about as well. And so it was really about once the Security Council authorizes um, a, a use of force to uh, protect populations, uh, how do we then hold what happens next? How do we hold the Security Council um, accountable, right? Because essentially what happened in Libya, and we can debate about whether that was a good intervention or not, it kind of, you know, it got out of hand. The Security Council was no longer in charge of what NATO was doing. Um, and then there were, you know, subsequent criticisms of regime change, etc. So this idea of somehow, you know, um, complementing R2P with RWP, so saying we also need to look at what happens once an intervention is, uh, is ongoing, I think that can also help to address some of the fears of inconsistency, selective application, et cetera. But I think perhaps the most important thing is we need to look towards other parts of the UN system um, to take more responsibility. So for one, the General Assembly. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, there's an excellent report that was published last year. Um, it's under the Global Center for R2Ps uh, on its website about the powers of the General Assembly in preventing mass atrocities. The General Assembly is not doing all that it can, right? So also for all the states from the global south who say, oh, the Security Council is not doing anything, you know, that, uh, what a terrible uh, you know, thing for us. Well, they could be doing more in the General Assembly as well. The Human Rights Council is another one. I mentioned earlier already that human rights is at the heart of R2P. There's lots that the Human Rights Council can do through its special procedures, through its universal periodic reviews, et cetera, et cetera. Um, regional organizations, perhaps we can talk more about that um, in, the, in the discussion. I think that's really important. But I also want to say uh, that states, all states, but particularly states in the global north are um, unfortunately uh, hypocritical in the way that they look at R2P. They see it entirely as a foreign policy issue, right? And that also does not create a sense of we're all in this together and, and R2P applies to everybody. Um, and so if we look at what happened in the US last year, right, on the 6th of January, the election related violence. Now, as somebody, if you're monitoring risks of potential atrocities, that kind of, you know, a, a, a challenge of an election result and, and potential violence that follows is a huge risk. It's a huge trigger. And so, you know, many, many of us in the field were saying, hang on a second. The U.S. is potentially at risk of atrocity crimes, right? Also in terms of the hate speech, the, the incredible uh, discrimination in the country, etc. The U.S. is doing, you know, a pretty good job in terms of looking at atrocity prevention as a foreign policy issue. But what is it doing in terms of looking internally and saying, we might also have a problem and we need to actually maybe set some national goals and develop some national strategies. 
Um, and then perhaps other countries in the global south will take us more seriously when we ask them to do the same. I'll stop there. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the panelists? If I could add just one brief comment. If we think of R2P as an obligation and we accept that that obligation is being breached, the responsibility to protect can be manifested in many different ways. We talked very briefly about intervening militarily. We talked very briefly about mili in intervening through aiding negotiations and peace talks and that and and otherwise mediation, other dispute resolution mechanisms that can be explored further, but that could be undertaken unilaterally by states that seek to intervene and, and support in compliance with their responsibility. But there's also another way that you could, you could approach this, and Noel touched upon it briefly, you could impose economic sanctions. So assuming that this international obligation is being breached, and it's being breached in such an egregious way, economic sanctions become a very powerful tool. They're not just a foreign policy tool, they're an international economic law tool. And what we're seeing at the moment with Ukraine is that many states have stepped up and imposed economic sanctions. And those economic sanctions that are imposed by states have waterfall effects. For for example, corporations in, in, in the interest of over compliance or adequate compliance, given that they might operate internationally in multiple jurisdictions, they're concerned about making sure that they meet the highest standard of obligations that they're being impo having imposed upon them through sanctions. So let's say the US, and I, I haven't seen studies of this, so I'm not sure how the sanctions may differ among different states at the moment, but let's say the US exposes X, Y, and Z sanctions, but the European Union only imposes X and Y sanctions. For sake of over compliance and ensuring that they don't breach their commercial and other legal obligations, multinational corporations will say, okay, let's take one corporate policy. Not only do we have a moral obligation, not only do we have responsibility to our consumers and our customers, but we also now have these legal obligations. So let's comply to the highest possible standard. Let's go to X, Y, and Z standard. So by setting these economic sanctions up, and setting up multinational corporations, which are which are key actors, right? You have to hit states or you have to hit bad actors where it hurts. Money is where it hurts. You have to, you have to control the flow of money or control the, the flow of their banking or control the flow of their economic activity. And if you were to impose economic sanctions, even if they differ, which can be really hard for legal compliance and, and coordination, it creates sort of a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. And that's usually the risk that you have in these kinds of situations. So, so I just present that this is where public international law and international relations start to dovetail with, you know, private action, corporations, you know, especially if we, we do divide the world up into the global north and the global south. And I have no opinion on those, those terms because it's not something I study, but in general, the terms sit awkwardly with me. I don't like them, but I also don't fully understand them enough to comment upon them. But if you do divide the world up in that way, these international corporations, multinational corporations are powerful actors throughout the world, regardless of where you may be. And they're even more powerful in the global south. Um, they certainly have the upper hand with respect to technology, investment, opportunity, infrastructure, et cetera. So this can become a really powerful tool. Thank you. And just for the sake of time, we do have to move on to the question and answer portion of this panel. I'm sorry to not get to your thoughts, Dr. Crossley. Um, so there are two microphones on either um, side of the aisle. And when you come to the microphone, please ask a question that is directed towards one panelist for the sake of time um, and try to keep your questions to under a minute. So we'll start with Julia. Hi, thank you. Um, this is directed towards Ms. Gore and Ms. Smith um, together. So I'm wondering if you think that ultimately, initially a positive obligation to support human rights, R2P has transferred through the implication of its use and its indication to a negative obligation to refrain from committing the four like Rome statute crimes of mass atrocity crimes, human rights uh, of mass atrocity crimes, um, to the point in which if you continue to refrain from these actions, you can maintain the sovereign equality of your state. Otherwise, intervention occurs. Because with Libya, despite what happened with NATO, arguably, in my opinion, potentially controversial, genocide might have been prevented. But it was not necessarily prevention, it was intervention. So is it this 
potential mindset of change to a negative obligation that makes it more of a an issue of equality of sovereignty and intervention instead of the prevention because ultimately r2p should be about prevention not intervention we should not escalate to that point that was a lot sorry <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, so I think for again, for the sake of time, we'll do like two or three questions together and the panelists will answer, try to answer all of them. Um, so we can go to this side of the aisle. Okay. Hi, my name is Isabella. I'm a political science major at Tufts. Um, and my question is, uh, Ms. Smith brought up that climate change might be considered a type of mass atrocity, especially considering large populations that have been displaced and we now refer to as climate refugees. Um, however, using a broader and more abstract definition of mass atrocity could lead to the delegitimization of R2P as a practice and could bring about critiques of using R2P strategically to address conflicts outside of violent conflict and human perpetrated genocide. Um, so my question is, how can we ensure that broadening the scope of R2P does not soften the impact of its application or result in parties withdrawing from the 2005 agreement? Thank you. Thank you, and we'll and so me if you'd like to. Oh, okay. Sorry, we'll go to this side of the aisle. Thank you. I'm Chester Eng. I'm a first year master's student here at Fletcher. I have a related question, and it's related to what's happening right now. Vladimir Putin did invoke R2P when he intervened in Donbas before the outright escalation in in Ukraine in the rest of Ukraine. So, would you classify his invocation of R2P as a breach or as selective application? Thank you, and I'll turn it over to you, the panelists. Okay, so I'll start with the first question. I think it was Julia. Um, so I think it's a really interesting idea to link the positive versus the negative obligations that R2P can imply. But I think it's a risky proposition from a legal perspective, because if you create too many if then scenarios, then you don't really know what to do. So I, I would at least posit that they're independent. They certainly both exist. I agree with you. There's both a negative obligation and a positive obligation. So a responsibility not to do harm. Um, I would think that we all accept that. Um, and then a responsibility to protect and intervene and, and both of them being facets of responsibility to protect. But I would see them in functioning independently. At least that's my personal view on this. Yeah, um, I think um, I'll address uh, the question on um, climate um, and protection responsibilities and widening of the um, of the responsibility to protect conceptually. Um, you know, as with human security, I think it's very comparable. There are advantages and disadvantages of widening and narrowing um, a term, um, both theoretically as well as when we think about implementation and, and, and policy making. Um, I, I don't know if uh, you are familiar with um, the work of Ed Luck, um, but he wrote a speech for the Secretary General um, in 2008 that he um, delivered at Oxford University. And so he came up with this idea of human protection. And it is a much wider kind of concept um, that really looks at all uh, the needs of vulnerable populations, both within the context of conflict, as well as um, outside of um, the context of conflict. And I think these kinds of concepts can help us um, think about um, protection responsibilities in these kinds of, of contexts um, as well. And, and conflicts are themselves very complex kinds of situations. So I think um, there may be an advantage um, to widening uh, that, uh, that, that protection concept. Um, I'll just quickly just add to uh, Julia's question. I think the emphasis is very much on on prevention, right? So it is it is about it's not because it's not necessarily states that are uh, committing the crimes, right? So the 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 emphasis on is on states protecting their populations from those crimes. So in that sense, it's really incumbent on them, right, under Pillar One, 
to be to be doing all of that stuff that we know contributes to building resilience against atrocity crimes, which includes things like uh, you know uh, promotion of human rights, etc. So I think that's why there's so much emphasis on the prevention side, uh, and that's how I would see it. So I don't know if that answers your question in, in, in some way. Um, just quickly to the climate change one, I think there's, uh, as Noel has said, right, there's a there's a great danger of, of stretching the concept too far and saying, oh yeah, it includes all of this other stuff, because then of course it does create the sense that, okay, you know, this is from the position of those who are concerned about RTP, this is exactly what we were worried about, right, kind of overstretch, and it's again just a kind of smoke screen for, uh, you know, an agenda for intervention in a way. Um, so how do we deal with climate change in that concept, in that context? Um, I, I agree with Ed Luck that we should keep, you know, he used to say, you know, keep it, keep it uh, kind of narrow and deep, right? So that was what he was talking about by really just limiting it to those four crimes. Um, that doesn't mean that we should not be paying attention to things like climate change as risk factors for atrocity crimes, right? That we should not, should not be doing a lot of research and saying, how is climate change acting as a risk multiplier? And there's been more work with regards to conflict uh, prevention uh, and not so much yet with regards to atrocity prevention, because I should also note that these are two different things, right? People often get them confused and say, oh, we're doing conflict prevention, therefore we are doing atrocity prevention. No, they're not the same thing. Um, so I think in that sense, it's really important to look at things like, I mean, I did a report two years ago on women and R2P, right? So looking at the gender relation. So that's again something. Um, so not saying this is now a, a new thing. It's part of R2P and we have to understand how this uh, increases the risk of, of people. Uh, that's essentially what's important. Chester, difficult question. I don't know where are you wearing now. Oh, here. Okay. Sorry. I'm kind of looking over there. Um, yes, of course, Putin evoked RTP, right? Yes, which is of course bizarre because Russia is one of the one of the big opponents of RTP at the UN. So absolutely, it just shows you how politicians selectively use language, principles, norms when it suits them. And I, and, I mean, sometimes I guess in a, in a kind of ironic way to say, look, we can use this as well, right? Um, I mean, I don't know what how one would classify that. I mean, it's it's I, I mean, it's it's. It doesn't make any sense, right? It's inaccurate because, as we know, RTP has to be, you know, if you're using military force, it has to go through the Security Council. So it cannot be, you know, Putin or, you know, any government deciding unilaterally that, you know, we are on the basis of RTP, we're going to go and uh, protect uh, populations. You could have done that. Well, could have, uh, you know, people did do that under humanitarian intervention, claiming that that was the reason they were, you know, going to different parts of the world, including the US. So let's not forget that in the current discussion about what Russia is doing, there's a lot of reference to, you know, hang on a second, but other states in the West have been doing this for some time as well. Um, and so, of course, this complicates this question of inconsistency as selective application, because it's not just one side or the other doing it selectively, it's everybody doing it selectively. If I could just add to that, there's a difference between inconsistent and selective application and wrongful invocation. I, I, I think I, I think Karen that was, was getting there, but didn't say it directly. Just because you said it's a duck doesn't make it a duck, right? So, so we've got to be quite honest. Um, and, and there should be standards. And that's why it, if it is a norm and we can measure it, and, and if people like Noel are doing quantitative and qualitative research to understand, well, this is the norm, this is what it entails, this is what it looks like in practice, then we can more directly call out those kinds of mistaken assertions. <laughs> I am not a politician. <laughs> Thank you for your responses. Um, how about we go with Salome and this group um, on this side of the aisle? Thank you. Hi, my name is Salome. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Tufts and I'm part of the Epic Colloquium. And my question, um, I wonder what the role that regional organizations play in desecuritizing the implementation of R2P. Hi, good morning. My name is Anna. I'm part of the Brazilian delegation here at the Epic. And my question is for Professor Smith, but if the other panelists want to answer, that's okay as well. Uh, do you believe that strengthening the participation and leadership of developing countries and the global South in R2P initiatives can have a positive impact, especially in the, the in terms of legitimacy? Thank you. <laughs> 
Hello, I am Rocio from the Argentina delegation. Um, I just wanted uh, to ask, I know you approach R2P from different points of, of view and disciplines, but if I may ask, what would you say to students, including myself, that want to shape their careers in R2P? Thank you. Um, yeah, so, okay. okay, I'll say, Salome, thank you very much for your question. And how did I guess that you were, where are you now again? I need to, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I guess that you might ask something about regional organizations. Um, interesting that you asked the question about desecuritizing the implementation of R2P, because I, I mean, I think that's one role that they can play, but I also think that they have been playing a role um, in terms of using security right if you want to call it secure well securitizing rtp is it has a kind of negative connotation um but i think if i if i could speak more generally about the role of regional organizations right it's all the things that we associate with why regional organizations are important in addressing issues of global governance including conflict including rtp um it's really about things like they are uh, they, they're closer to the source in the sense they often have a better understanding of the context, whether historical, cultural, political, etc. They tend to have more legitimacy, not always, right? It really depends on who are the other actors, if they are kind of, you know, uh, hegemonic players in a particular region, what their relationship is with the country, etc. Um, but I think so I don't know if I have an answer specifically, maybe one of the others due to the question of this, uh, desecuritizing the implementation of RTP. What I can say is the, the success stories of where uh, atrocities have been prevented, right? And I think of the election violence in Kenya in 2007, 2008, the constitutional crisis in the Gambia in 2017. Regional and sub-regional organizations were, at, were in the lead here, right? They were the ones who were really, um, yeah, taking the lead in terms of reaction, both 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 with regards to uh, mediation, you know, fact finding, so all of those bit more specific measures, but then also the more coercive measures. They were the ones who sent in troops, right, uh, in the Gambia when it seemed like uh, things were going the wrong way. It was ECOWAS who did that. So I think there's really lots more that we need to look at in terms of how can we. Um, and, and this would be a legal question, right? Because at, at the moment, of course, RTP, it has to be authorized by the Security Council. In practice, we've seen things happening like the Security Council retroactively kind of approving action by uh, or sub-regional sub organizations like ECOWAS. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done there in terms of what can we do to help regional organizations play a much more important role? Uh, and maybe if I can just stick with that, because that maybe links to the question about the leadership of, of the global south in terms of, and where are you now? Yes, there you are. Sorry, sorry, Anna. Um, absolutely, right? This is how we build legitimacy at the UN. And, and it's about some of the things I said earlier. There is this strong suspicion still uh, between, and call it the global north, the global south, just for, you know, for conceptual purposes, I make this distinction. Um, and, and it shouldn't surprise us, right? It has historical, uh, there are historical reasons for this. And so it's really about continuing this dialogue. Um, and so that was one of the things that I was trying to do while I was at the UN, is trying to get more involvement by states from the global south. Um, at the moment, I think it's, it's, it's great. There is leadership. So there's a group of friends of R2P at the UN, both in New York and in Geneva. So I don't know if you know, but group, group of friends are essentially groupings at the UN of like-minded states who, who get together to uh, promote particular issues. Um, currently, there are three co-chairs of the group of friends. It's, um, it's Botswana, it's Croatia, and it's Costa Rica which I think gives you an indication that this is not something which is led by the West, right? So I think that's really encouraging. Um, but we also see that. So with regards to um, Argentina, for example, within the, the organization of American states, um, Argentina plays quite a quite important role. Peru and others as well in terms of promoting the idea of RTP at the regional level, again, within that particular context. Uh, Brazil used to, uh, as we know, you know, things have changed in Brazil. So this is a challenge, I think, to Brazilian students as well to say, what can we do in future for to have Brazil play more of a thank a you, Dr. Smith. Sorry, <laughs> just for the sake of time, um, I wanted to get to the sure. other panel. Sorry about that.
people. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, I was just trying to say, I think the role of regional organizations is incredibly important. Um, um, I uh, traveled to Addis uh, in Ethiopia a couple of years ago, just before uh, the pandemic began, and um, and interviewed um, some African Union uh, officials. And what I found in all of their um, statements, what, what they all had in common was really a lack of resources. So um, they want to be involved, um, uh, but there are limitations in terms of what can be achieved simply because the resources don't exist. So I think if we think about it in terms of agency, regional agency, we also need to think about um, the structure of funding um, these things um, very simply. So, so, so there's that issue. But um, I think in terms of legitimacy, for the responsibility to protect regional organizations are incredibly important. Um, in terms of, I think there was one question about, uh, about careers um, uh, 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 related to advancing the responsibility to protect principle. And I think this also ties into um, the consistency question and addressing uh, selected application and advancing the norm of responsibility to protect. And I think we, we tend to think R2P states, IOs, the United Nations, but actually there are so many more actors involved. And this is, I think, this also creates amazing career opportunities because uh, almost any career track you can think of, you can now think about how what you can do um, to help uh, consolidate uh, res uh, international protection uh, responsibilities. So think about, okay, there's diplomacy. Uh, states think about international organizations, not just the UN, other international organizations. Think about what you could do in academia, for example, um, in public education more widely. I think um, there's still uh, an absence of, of coverage uh, of these kinds of questions at uh, the secondary level. So there's, there's a lot that could be done uh, there in terms of public education, in terms of civil society, human rights organizations, humanitarian organizations, um, Amnesty International, um, uh, Human Rights Watch, MSF, uh, Red Cross, and so on, um, as well as, of course, international law, uh, legal careers, I think might be a good avenue as well. I, if I could just make two brief comments on the question of legitimacy, assuming we are in a place where it is accepted that there's an R2P norm, the next step, and it would support the idea of legitimacy, and, and perhaps this also comes back to the Putin question that we were asked by Chester earlier, is you develop a legal test, you develop standards, you, you develop ways to measure compliance, lack of compliance, reaction. And it, it's it's sort of a burden of proof question. So so coming back to Putin, the, he, he said it was, he invoked R2P. Well, this is also his burden or Russia's burden to demonstrate that that invocation of R2P was correct. But you can't do that and, and you don't get legitimacy around the concept unless there's a test to be drawn upon. So, so I just throw that out there, that legitimacy and burden and evidence, all of that comes together, especially if you look at it from the obligations that otherwise exist elsewhere in international law. For example, at the International Criminal Court, right? We keep hearing, oh my gosh, there's war crimes going on right now. But it's not that we've concluded there are war crimes. It's that in order to say that there are war crimes, we have to do an entire fact finding and evidentiary collection process. So that burden should fall equally on, on all sides of the coin. My last comment on careers, I might ask that you all think a little bit smaller and baby stepped. And you could all be writing about, thinking about, speaking to people, planning conferences like this one where R2P plays a central role. What, what I love about the current world we live in is that everything is decentralized and everybody's a creator and we're all in a position to disrupt the norms. And so if you think R2P is important, you can talk about it, which, which is what I like to do. And I think what everybody else on this panel likes to do, including Ellie, who came up with this idea for this panel. I, I think she came up with this idea for this panel. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your responses. Um, we are getting into the time of the second panel. And um, if and so if there are more questions, we'll be having a breakout session at 2.30 um, where you'll be able to ask the panelists more questions um, about R2P and international intervention. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Um,